Thank you, Bethany. I appreciate it. And welcome, everybody. My name is Lisa Lutz. I'm president and chair of the military. Of, I mean, I'm president and CEO of Solutions for Information Design. Um, and I am chair, as Bethany said, of the Institute for Credentialing Excellence Military Credentialing Task Force. I have had the good fortune of working in the area of credentialing of service members and veterans since the mid 1990s. And I have supported a number of efforts at the Department of Defense with other military services and other government and private sector organizations. I've also had an opportunity to serve on a variety of federal committees and on ICE's Government Affairs Committee and the ANSI, the American National Standards Institute National Accreditation Board, um, their Professional Certification Accreditation Committee. When ICE asked me if I'd take the lead on the task force, I was very pleased to do so because this is definitely an issue that is near and dear to my heart. And I have been very fortunate to work with a great team who I will introduce to you in just a moment. But before we do that, I just wanted to tell you briefly what our agenda is going to be today. So we're first gonna talk a little bit about what we mean by facilitating credentialing and how it applies to the military and the veteran community as well as what the impetus was for starting the task force and creating the toolkit. We're gonna to then spend a little bit of time going through the toolkit so you can better understand the features and the resources it provides. And then we'll open it up for discussions. So as Bethany said, please use the Q&A section to put your questions out for, um, for us to answer. Thank you. Susan, you're up next, I believe. Hi, I'm Susan Davis Becker. I'm a partner in psychometrician with ACS Ventures. Um, I'm really excited to have been a part of this task force. I, I will admit I learned quite a lot. There's so much great stuff in this toolkit. So we're very excited to be here today to share it with you. Kelly, I'll turn it over to you. Kelly, I think you're on mute. Hi, everybody. I am Kelly Markavich, Assistant Executive Director with the Spray Polyurethane Foam Alliance. We're a construction-based trade association, and uh, I joined and started in the credentialing arena about 10 years ago with absolutely no working knowledge of working with the military. When we recognized the need um, to enhance our task, our workforce, um, it seemed logical to, to thank military because the military come with such strong work ethics and, and strong experience, um, but I wasn't sure where to start. So I reached out to ICE, got involved with their government affairs committee and was fortunate enough to work with this team of folks um, who really do have the experience in this arena. So like many of you, um, I had a lot of questions as I came and like Susan said, um, I've learned a lot along the way. So I think I was a, probably on this task force a great, um, resource just because I was so green to the industry and, and um, had some questions. So I think you'll find that the toolkit is, is something that will be very useful to you. And I'm um, excited to be launching it with, with this great group of people I've worked with. And now I'd like to hand it over to Sue Jackson with Pearson View. Sue. Thank you, Kelly, and welcome everybody. I'm Sue Jackson, the Director of Market Development for Government and Military from Pearson View. And during my 22 years with Pearson View, I have spent nearly two decades working with every branch of the armed services and supporting the civilian and the contractor community. It has been a pleasure to serve on this committee with Lisa, Susan, and Kelly to create this military and veteran toolkit. This toolkit helps credentialing organizations understand this market and determine best practices regarding credentialing for the military communities. Let me advance one slide. Thank you. So ICE formed the Military and Veteran Task Force for the creation of the toolkit we'll be discussing today. This toolkit is a resource that credentialing organizations can use to reach and attract military community candidates. Now you may be wondering about the value in reaching this audience. Think of the military as a microcosm of society with their own clinics and hospitals, dentist office, lawyers, IT staff, banks, grocery stores, just to name a few. This community is a large group of motivated, experienced, and often well-funded professionals. There are approximately 2.1 million service members currently serving in active duty reserve or National Guard roles. 
About 250,000 of those service members transition to the civilian sector each year, joining a United States veteran network of more than 18.2 million people. This provides an incredible opportunity to grow your credentialing program while supporting the military community. Service members are also trained professionals. In addition to their military specific training and duties, each member of the armed services works in a military defined occupation. While some occupations may be unique to the military, many also exist in the civilian workplace, including healthcare, information technology, and finance positions, to name a few. This creates a significant talent pipeline for industry organizations seeking additional professionals to fill open positions. Also, service members and veterans can often receive federal funding for credentials, and they can take some credential exams on base or even online. This reduces the barrier to entry and makes the certification more accessible to this population. Later on in this webinar, you're going to hear more about the types of possible funding and how you can use this toolkit to help service members access government funding. All of this helps explain why the military community is such an attractive audience, but we still need service members and veterans to care about the value and the impact of credentialing in order to work, to want to use their benefits, apply their knowledge and expertise, and ultimately sit for a credentialing exam. Before I highlight the credentialing benefits that are specific to the military community, let's start with what we know about credentialing more broadly. In the current employment landscape, Credentials are a critical piece in securing meaningful employment for many individuals. In 2020, 47% of all civilian workers were required to have a credential as a condition for hiring. Some fields like healthcare have significantly higher credential requirements of 94%. And even in fields where there were no requirements, workers who held credentials, which include certifications, licensures, or educational certificates often have a leg up on the competition. Particularly in the era of COVID-19 when we have seen the impact the pandemic has had on employment. So clearly credentialing is important for the general population. But what benefits do credentials have for service members who already have a secure employment? First and foremost is that it is good for their career and encouraged by military service leadership. Civilian credentials are viewed as a component of force readiness and are often referenced during promotional consideration within the military, if not outright required to perform specific roles. Additionally, funding programs such as branch specific credentialing opportunities online are well supported financially and culturally within the military. And service members may be inclined to re-up in order to complete credential requirements or stack their completed credentials onto a more advanced program. But beyond just a line on their resume or in their file, credentials are beneficial for service members' daily roles as well. Credentialing provides service members with more visibility and fluency in the civilian industry norms, trends, and terminology. This is important because the armed services often refer to techniques and processes differently than civilian organizations performing similar functions. Understanding the civilian terminology and process differences not only creates a better trained force, it also encourages more collaboration and understanding during private and public partnerships. Additionally, translating those terminology differences is a significant factor for transitioning service members and veterans seeking certification. By knowing the terminology used in the civilian sector, military community members can better verify their knowledge, skills, and experience for civilian hiring managers, increasing the likelihood that they are able to find employment once they separate from the military. So now that we have established the growth potential of the military community, and we've touched on a few reasons why service members and veterans would be inclined to pursue credentials. And before I hand it over to Lisa to walk to the specifics of the toolkit, I want to quickly highlight how you can integrate it into your broader military community outreach programs. 
When we're talking about facilitating credentialing for military service members, veterans and their families, we're looking at ways the credentialing community can ensure equity of access and attainment by addressing the unique needs of this population. As you will see momentarily, the toolkit provides a blend of resources, explanations, and directions that you can use to help service members and veterans navigate the funding request and approval process. You can also use this toolkit to facilitate access to the very geographical dispersed population so that they can test where they live and work without disruption to their active duty assignments or professional careers. Finally, similar to the translation and understanding benefits for service members, this toolkit will conversely help credentialing organizations recognize and incorporate military training and expertise into eligibility requirements, encouraging more qualified military professionals to consider your program. With that, I'm going to turn it back to Lisa to go through the toolkit, and then we'll have an opportunity for questions and answers. Lisa? Yeah, thank you, Sue. I appreciate it. And um, Corinne is helping us out with the slides today, so she's going to help us navigate through the tools, tool while I speak to it. Um, so you will be able to access the tool. Of course, we're going to share the slides with you that will include a link to the tool, but you'll be able to access it from the Institute for Credentialing Excellence's um, main uh, website. And we, when you go to the website, I think, wait a minute, we'll give you a second, Corinne, to get to the website. One second. So while, while she's pulling up the website, I'm just going to to talk highly to or thank the the Institute for Credentialing Excellence for for giving us this opportunity and for recognizing military and veterans as important constituents in the um, credentialing arena. So we're seeing the, um, the the homepage of the Credentialing Excellence website. If we go to the resources section in the top navigation, you'll see that there's a um, link to military and veterans, and that's going to take you to the homepage of our new military and veterans toolkit. <clears throat> the first few sections of the tool are really intended to convey to the credentialing agencies and other stakeholders the value proposition of making targeted efforts to better engage military and veterans in pursuing credentials. Sue did an excellent job of highlighting some of these um, value propositions. And so I'm not going to go over the first two sections in any depth. But I did want to encourage you to spend a little bit of time getting familiar with the messaging that we've put out here so that if you have an opportunity to represent um, your certification agency and help add your voice to these benefits when you're talking to your boards, your constituents, and to other stakeholders, getting the message out is going to be a, a major part of helping service members get the credentials that they need. So Corinne, I think we'll scroll down um, and go down to the, uh, the what, yep, very good. What can you do to facilitate credentialing? I think, I think uh, Sue did a very good job of highlighting how credentialing supports the entire military life cycle. So what are some of the things that you can do to facilitate credentialing of service members? On the homepage here, we've highlighted just a few of them and then you can click on the learn more button, which we can do it, we'll do in a minute to tell you um, some more best practices that you might use to facilitate credentialing. As you scroll down, you'll see some testimonials from service members and veterans as to why certification is important to them. Um, I will mention that this includes Ms. Sophia Sweeney, who happens to be now, she was in uniform, but she is now the Army civilian in charge of the Army's credentialing program. And then finally, at the bottom of the of the homepage, you'll see you can navigate the toolkit. And this tells you each of the sections of the toolkit and what you might expect to find within them. So why don't we go ahead and get started? And, and Corinne, let's click on get approved for funding. And again, you can navigate from either the bottom or from the main um, navigation. So over the years, as recognition has increased of the value of civilian credentials for military service members and veterans, a variety of programs have been stood up that help offset the cost of credentialing. 
Since 2003, the VA, the Department of Veterans Affairs, has offered payment of certification and licensure up to $2,000 per test, and there is no limit on the number of tests that they will pay for. Credentialing agencies just need to seek approval from the state in which they are headquartered. And there's a link here within the tool that shows you how to go to the state approving agency for your state to see how you can go about getting approved for GI Bill funding. And basically this is going to allow the service member to have their exam and other administration fees paid for. The other place where there's um, funding opportunities are the services credentialing programs. The military ser services all have policies and procedures for paying for credentials. There is a, some variation across the services in terms of which credentials they will pay for. And the variations might include the types of fees that they will pay or the types of credentials that they will pay for. So when it comes to the types of fees that they'll pay, some of them like, um, like the GI Bill will pay for the certification administration fees. That might be the cost associated with the exam or application fees, that kind of thing. Um, and then other services will also pay for certification preparation courses or other materials, which might include study guides or online um, training, that kind of thing. And then the types of credentials that they pay for vary, but it's mostly, it's, it's going to be certifications and licenses, primarily federal licenses. And the certifications in some instances, they need to be directly related to the military uh, service members' current military occupation. In other cases, some of the services will allow them to venture out into some of their other areas that might include, include collateral duties or other types of um, qualifications that they might have. We'll show you as we go through the tool how you can find out more about the individual services policies and where they're alike and where they're similar. One of the things that some of you might be familiar with is that each of the services have initiatives to facilitate credentialing that are called Credentialing Opportunities Online, or COOL for short. These programs basically highlight their policies. And it, when you go to the websites, you can see how specific credentials have been aligned with various military occupations and how your specific certification or license has been aligned to the variety of military training and experience. So to give you just a little bit of a sense of how you might explore some of the cool websites, we're gonna to go to the DOD Cool Portal. She's clicking on the DOD Cool link. And if you scroll down just a tad, we'll show you how you can access each one of the services individual cool websites. You'll find that the websites are organized very similarly. They have a similar look and feel for the most part, and they have similar types of information. On each services website, you're gonna find out about general information, about credentialing, um, what a credential is, how it might be uh, helpful for, for a service member to pursue while they're in the military, what considerations they might make in terms of considering a specific certification. And then most importantly, we show how the individual service member's military occupation aligns to civilian credentialing requirements and where there might be some gaps in the alignment between the military training and experience and the civilian credentialing requirements. And that's something that's important to note because there are very few um, military occupations that directly align to a civilian occupation. Many of them are very, fairly closely aligned um, and there may be some minimal gaps and some of them are a little bit further apart in terms of sharing the same kinds of duties and uh, required skills and knowledge. So the cool websites will help the service member and other stakeholders like credential bodies see how well the specific certification or license aligns to their, to their own training. Um, if you could scroll down just a little bit, we'll show you um, a couple of the other sections. You can go to um, this section to see, get the most out of DOD cool. And you can see that it's organized towards different stakeholder groups, whether you're a service member, a recruiter, a counselor, um, or a credentialing organization. So I definitely encourage you, if you are a credentialing organization, to go in and, and explore that section more. Um, but let's go for a moment and scroll back up to the top. 
And I'm going to show you if you are a specific credentialing agency that wants to know if your certifications are already aligned to a military occupation, how you can readily find that out on the DOD COOL website. So Corinne is going to click, click on the research related credentials arrow. And there's, you'll see there's a variety of search capabilities. For today's demonstration, we're going to keep it simple and we're just going to check, check <laughs> click a specific agency. Um, and we have pre-selected one of our attendees, American Medical Certification Association. Um, and Corinne will just click on search. And then you can see down below that the certifications by the AMCA show up here along with some of other indicators. And if you can show the column headers, Corinne, we'll just show you briefly. You'll have a link to the certification on the certification agency's website. There's a link to the agency, the, the homepage of the agency. The next column is in demand. And if that, call, if that certification has been identified by the Department of Labor as particularly prominent in online job ads, it will have an indicator within that column. The next column over shows whether or not the certification has been approved for GI Bill payment. And you can see that the ACMA has done that for some of its certifications. The next um, uh, column over shows the accreditation status. And this will be completed if the certification program itself has been accredited by one of the main national accrediting bodies, including the National Commission for Certifying Agencies, as well as the American National Standards Institute, National Accrediting Board, and a couple of others. Um, the next is more for the service members' knowledge, but it's, um, it's uh, the credential type, and it will tell you if it's a certification or a license. The database includes literally 2,000 or more certifications and then probably some hundreds of um, federal licenses as well. And then the final column shows you which service we have linked that particular certification to. So in other words, um, whether the Army, the Navy, the Air Force, the Coast Guard, or the Marine Corps um, has a military occupation that aligns to this certification. For this particular agency, it's, it's a more healthcare oriented um, certification agency. And since the Marine Corps does not have healthcare, they rely on the, the Navy for their healthcare, um, those, you're not gonna see any Marine Corps occupations that have been aligned to it. So Corinne, um, if you could expand the list, there's, I think there's more than 10 entries. And if you could just go up to the top and, and click all of them, you can see all of the certifications again. And we're going to select the physical therapy technician aid. And just clicking to show you how a service has mapped that particular certification, let's go ahead and yeah, go ahead to the Army. And this is our certification snapshot page. For, so for the ACMA's physical therapy technician slash aid certification, you can see the renewal period, you can see a description of the certification. Um, I realize some of this is a little bit hard to see on the screen, but um, down below you can see a summary of the minimum requirements, the exam requirements, agency contact information, that kind of thing. More information is under, if you click on related occupations, it will show you specifically, because we're on Army Cool, this shows you the Army military occupation that has been linked to it. In this case, it's the physical therapy specialist. And then if you go over to the summary tab on, at near the top there, Corinne, outside of the table, there you go. Um, and click on the, that's the summary that we showed you, sorry. And then the next, next one over is eligibility. And this shows you the more specific eligibility requirements. So this certification has a, has a requirement that an individual must have a high school diploma and be 18 years of age. And it shows you various options for qualifying um, to meet the education, training, and experience requirements. Um, and then any other requirements that might be key to attaining the certification would be listed here. Now, clearly these are specific to that, the, the PTTC certification, but for any other certification, you'd see similar information um, that would capture the eligibility requirements. If we could go over to the exam tab now, Corinne. Click on the exam. 
this is showing you basically the, um, the exam topics that are covered. And this can be very helpful for the service member who wants to know, you know what kinds of knowledge they're gonna be tested on. So it gives you the proportion of the test devoted to the different exam domains. There's also information on exam preparation. There's um, how, what sources might be available to help you prepare for the exam, testing information, where you can go to get the um, to actually take the test. And then the final tab is the recertification tab that gives you a little bit more information about what you need to do in order to keep your certification current. So that's just a, um, a highlight of some of the information that you can find by using DoD Cool to drill down to the individual Cool's websites. Um, let's go back to the ICE toolkit and just finishing out this page, um, you'll see that there's more information on researching the related credentials and to see if your credentials are already on Cool. And you'll also see that we have links to the services credential payment policies, um, including at the very bottom there, a side-by-side -side comparison of the credential payment policies across the services. So you can get a better sense of the types of credentials that they provide and the amount of funding that they provide. All right, let's go back to the top navigation and we'll go to the best practicing practices for facilitating credentialing. This page has two main sections that I'm going to go over just briefly, um, but again, I encourage you to go out and take a closer look at it. The best practices or the first part is just kind of setting up again the context for credentialing in the military the fact that it's focused primarily on certification and licensure and, and to a smaller extent apprenticeship, um, at least as it relates to the credential payment program. Um, and then down below, we get into the best practices overview. And there's quite a bit of information here that I encourage you to go to, but just a few of the types of best practices I'll highlight are ensuring the quality and value, how you can go about demonstrating that you're your certification is you know, a gold standard because it's been accredited by a third party accrediting body. Another shows you how to go, how you can get approved for GI Bill funding so that you can um, make that readily accessible to veterans who come to the certification to get a uh, certification body to attain the certification. Talks a little bit about recertification requirements and how you might wanna think about the fact that when service members are deployed it can be difficult sometimes for them to meet the certification requirements. This is not to say that they can't because service members on deployment have um, actively been pursuing certifications and recertification, but there may be at times when they're in a position where they can't for some reason keep up with, the, um, with all of the stringent requirements or to go back and find a testing facility if a retesting is required. So, um, give some of those considerations and maybe considering, consider the ability to waive some of the recertification or postpone the recertification requirements until they're back from deployment. Um, and then finally, towards the very bottom, Corinne, I think we've talked a little bit about ensuring that your exams are widely available. Being able to offer um, online exams has been tremendously helpful for the geographically dispersed um, service members and veterans, uh, particularly during the time of COVID. And I think as many of you know, we've seen a, an uptake, a tremendous uptake in the number of online certification um, exam opportunities that have come about in the past year or more. So those are just a few of the, the best practices and there's lots more information. Um, very briefly, I wanted to jump over to the Military 101. One of the things that we hear quite a bit from um, credentialing bodies is that, you know, I, 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 I kind of understand what you're saying. I get that there's a value. I think this is the right thing to do for service members who have done so much for our country, but I frankly don't understand the military. And because, you know, only about 1% of our population in the United States has actually served in the military, that's not surprising. And so the toolkit includes this Military 101 section for those of you who'd like to just get kind of a primer on the various components of the military, the, the services, what they do, that kind of thing. You can download the presentation. 
And this might actually help you if you wanna educate your staff or stakeholders as well. And Corinne's gonna pull that up just briefly and I'll just show you some of the topics that are covered in there. Does it pop onto a different screen, Corinne? If it's not opening, that's okay. We 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 do we do um, highlight them to the right there. So, what are some of the different brands? There we go. Good, excellent. Thank you. You can see it's uh, it's uh, branded to look a lot like the toolkit, but um, this is just a high level of some of the things that you can find in the PowerPoint. What are the different branches of the military? What are the ranks in the military? It's helpful to understand that, you know, there's the enlisted community and then there's the officer community. And there's different nuances related to that. The officer community almost always goes into the military with a degree, um, some type of, a, you know, an academic credential. And that's helpful to them in their careers, but it's also helpful to them as they transition out. The enlisted community, on the other hand, doesn't always go in with any type of post-secondary credential, whether it's an academic or a non-academic, like a certification or a licensure. And the enlisted folks are the ones that are getting their primary occupation experience and training from the military. And because that is kind of a non-traditional form of training education, it makes it a little bit more difficult, as Sue referenced, to translate how your skills that you've gained in the military are on par with your civilian counterparts. So um, this will tell you a little bit more about how, how to better recognize and how to help the enlisted community in particular um, attain the certification that shows that their skills really are, are on par. Um, this tells you also about the types of experience and the types of training and education that service members achieve. The military does invest tens of thousands of dollars in providing high quality training to its service members and veterans. If any of you have had the privilege of going out to a military training facility and see the high tech um, uh, technology and other mechanisms of learning that are presented to the service member, it's very, very impressive. Um, and not only do they get the high quality training, but that is reinforced with sometimes years of experience. So um, it's very important to recognize that, that they bring a lot of the service members and veterans, any military trained applicant brings a lot of qualifications to the table. Um, and then the presentation will also show you some of the tools that are available to you to help assess the transferability of military training. Um, and experience. And it goes into some of the types of the formal documentation that a service member could offer to you to show the military occupations that they've held or the military training that they've held. It will talk about things like a um, joint service transcript that's available to every service member to show their military training courses and also to see the American Council on Education recommended college credit for that course another clear indicator of the equivalency of the military training to um, the more traditional civilian academic um, learning. So I again encourage you to utilize all of the things that are within the, within the presentation to learn a little bit more. Um, and we're going to just go briefly to one more section of the website and then we're going to open it up to questions, which I am just seeing a note from Bethany that the Q&A isn't working for some reason, so but hopefully we're tracking them in both the chat uh, and perhaps in the Q&A. So the last section um, of the toolkit that you can find by clicking on that top navigation is the resources section. And these just provide some additional links out to um, some various things that might be helpful to you as you're learning more about the military as a stakeholder group and how you might market to the military. What are some of the messaging uh, messages that you would wanna to convey to them? What are some of the things that you might wanna include in your website to show a service member the specific uh, areas in which you've targeted um, facilitating their attainment of a credential? There's stock imagery where you can go that's been approved by the Department of Defense Public Affairs if you wanted to use some of the imagery to include it on your website and appeal to that stakeholder group. And then there are a variety of other resources here, some of which we've talked about already and, and some that are new. So 
Um, again, I encourage you to take some time and explore. I hope that you found that this is useful and I am going to turn it over to Kelly, I believe, who's going to, who's been monitoring our questions and we'll do our best to see if we can answer your questions. Yes, thank you. We do have a couple of questions and someone did raise their hand. So, but I'll take the questions in the order that they were submitted. And if you are having um, question, uh, problems with the Q&A section, just put it into the chat section. So hold on. This, this question comes from a group um, whose credentials are already in the National VA credential list. They provide nurses specialty credentials. And the question is that since they just launched a voucher discount program for employers, employers can purchase in bulk, but how do they apply and market this to the military? And this includes exam application, exam application and exams, as well as recertification exams. Very good. Esteemed colonists answer, thank you. Yeah, I'd be happy to answer. Um, so when you go to the DOD Cool website and you can go to the individual services website, each of the pages have a, has a contact us page that's available in the footer of pretty much every page um, and also on the home page. You can then submit um, a request to be included or to talk to a service representative about um, learning more about your credentialing program. That's also a way if your certification is not already listed on one of the cool websites that you could find out if um, we might consider adding it to the websites. Um, I'm glad to see that it's already on the national VA credential list. That's fantastic um, and love to hear more. And I think there's an opportunity. I will mention as well that um, the services cool programs are very highly coordinated. They work closely together. They have an inter-service credentialing working group that is um, chaired right now, it's chaired by the Navy. And so if you submit a question on a DOD Cool website, it will trickle down to all the services. Thank you, Lisa. And a follow-up to that is, does the toolkit include how to be added to Cool? It sure does, yes. Okay, great. And this is from a different participant. They are in the Cool program for their four certifications but the Army now has the IGNITE program also, which has to apply, you have to apply to be included. What's the difference between these programs? So you've hit on um, one, of the, one of the elements of the variations across the services. Um, so the, the Army has a couple of different things that are going on. So they have institutionally delivered credentialing, which means that the credential is offered usually in tandem with the military training. It's still considered a voluntary credential, but um, those are typically credentials that are fairly closely aligned to the military occupation. And it also has a more a broader voluntary credentialing program where an army soldier can apply to um, a, for a variety of certifications that meet their qualifications. Um, and then the other piece that the Army has that's a little bit different than uh, some of the services is that the Army will pay for credential preparation programs, and that includes training programs, study materials, that kind of thing. Um, the, uh, the COOL website really captures primarily the voluntary credential programs that have been approved for payment. It will also show you how if you are a provider of credential preparation programs where you can go and, and find out more about how to qualify to get payment for those as well. All of that information is heavily um, captured within the Army Cool website. So if you go out to the DOD Cool website and then go to Army Cool, you should be able to find a great deal of information that helps with that. Thank you, Lisa. And this question is from a participant um, from the AACN. Um, who asks or explains that they're launching a live remote proctoring as an additional computer-based testing option. How would she request updates for the info about their certification programs appearing on the COAL site? Same way that you would request um, any other information about COAL. You go to the, the services homepage and you, um, you put in the question you have or about how to get that information updated and it will trickle down. So 
the information that's on the cool websites is contained in a very large database and it's the same database populates all of the cool websites. So if you get the information about your requirements or testing options and that kind of thing changed for one of the websites, it's gonna trickle over to all of the websites as well. Thank you. Um, this question is, this organization has five credentials which could be applicable. Do you recommend that we start with one and then once approved, proceed with the others or should we go with all of their offerings? My suggestion would be to go ahead and submit all of the offerings and the screening process, the services in the Department of Defense have a screening process that's comparable across the services in terms of determining whether it meets the basic DOD credential standards. The standards are specified in legislation um, and they loosely can include various things like, um, is your certification in demand? Has it been accredited? It doesn't have to be accredited, but that's a bonus in terms of getting it reviewed if it's been accredited by a third party um, personnel certification accreditor. It also goes into, um, it also has a variety of criteria, which again are highlighted within the toolkit, but, um, as you go through the criteria, as, as we get a request, I'm sorry, to evaluate a certification for inclusion on COOL, our first step is to determine if it's been related to a military occupation um, in any across the services. And then if it is, it moves forward from there. So the request again would be submitted to any of the services COOL websites. It will be monitored across the cool websites and they, the credentialing body will be asked to fill out a standards form that answers a series of questions um, that is used to gauge whether it might qualify for the, uh, for the cool website. Thank you, Lisa. This next question is, is there anything in the toolkit regarding a program to provide exam administration internationally to military families stationed outside the US? I'm gonna kick that over to Sue maybe because Sue is a, is a testing company that does represent, uh, is a represented national, I mean, global, global globally. <laughs> Thanks Lisa. Yeah, I, you know, if you have a testing vendor that offers global test delivery, you can certainly open that up to your service members that are deployed overseas. What Pearson View has done is actually um, set up testing centers at the bases. So if you have a service member that's deployed, one thing you have to consider is if they have to go off the base to use a um, in-country test center, that they're gonna have to pay in US dollar and there may be translation issues. So consider uh, when you're testing overseas to make sure that your centers will accept US dollar because that's all that the government will pay in or find a vendor that does offer on-base testing. And another great solution is the online testing that's available now. Thank you, Sue. Uh, the next question is, um, hi, I work for a company where we currently provide education and credentialing to various government agencies, but we are not approved on COAL or for the GI funding. How do we go about getting approved through COAL? And do we need to have each of our credentials designations approved? Yeah, and I think I've touched on that just a little bit, but again, um, you can request it by going to any one of the services cool websites and, and noting your agency and the credentials that you'd like to have evaluated. Um, since you mentioned both education, I think you said education and credentialing, um, just keep in mind that there are different approval processes. If, you, if you're providing credential preparation training, that only is paid for currently by the Army and by the Air Force. Um, if you, but certification administration fees like exams and other administration fees like um, application fees are covered across the services. So um, the cool websites will show you the latter. They will show you the certifications that have been approved for payment of the administrative fees. And then if you go directly to the Army or the Air Force cool website, you can also find out more about how to get um, Training provide or training that you might provide approved as well. Thank you. Um, and I it looks like this may be our final question, but it the question is: We recently became an approved vendor for Army. Is there a simple infographic that we can add to our candidates' guide to help service members understand how the process would work? 
I believe we do have something like that um, on the Army Cool website. And what I would encourage you to do is, is to ask that question on Army Cool and we'll make sure we get that answer right out to you. Also, I think if your name is in here, I'd be happy to, to follow up with you regarding that. And then Kelly, I think we did have one hand raised. I don't know if that Phyllis is that, still. I saw Phyllis, but then I saw a question from a Phyllis. Um, oh, okay. Is Phyllis, did we answer your question? If you can just quickly answer in the chat box. And are there any other questions? Uh, I know everyone is muted, but if you can type quickly into the chat box, we will keep an eye on that. Oh, I do have another um, question. Hello to all of us. Um, this group has a three-level certification that has already been approved for the COOL programs, but would like to also get approved for GI funding. Does the toolkit cover that? Um, it covers how to get approved for GI Bill funding as well. Yes, it does. There's a direct link that will take you over to the, um, the VA's state approving agency website. Again, if you're, you, you would apply in the state in which your certification organization is headquartered and you can go out and there's, there's some instructions on how you would go about getting approved for that. And I, I think that there's a related question that Kelly, I'm sorry, you might've mentioned it. I'm not sure if I answered, but just to be clear, the VA list is different than the COOL list. Um, the COOL websites show you already what certifications have been approved by the VA. They get a quarterly data feed from the VA to show what's been approved. Um, but the process for getting your certification approved for VA funding is separate than for getting it approved for the, for the COOL funding. Great, thank you. And there is an additional question. Um, just a quick follow-up to a previous question. Do testimonials help the approval process? Um, I'm not sure if I know what you mean by that. The, the testimonials by, can you, can you be a little bit more specific? Let me go back and see if I can find the, her original sure. question here. Oh, I think you might mean testimony, approval process of getting your certification body approved for the Army. I mean, for one of the cool websites. While you're looking, Kelly, I'll, I'll answer that and assume that's the right question, but I'm happy to be corrected. Um, so if you mean like a testimonial from a service member, not really. The, the approval process is pretty standardized. Um, and I think that, you know, one of the things that we've noted, though, is that the services in the process of paying for credentials one of the things that they do get is a lot of feedback from service members about any, any problems that they might've had with an agency or, or an agency that's been particularly helpful to them. And that in and of itself can be helpful to inform um, the services. But if you have a service member or somebody else who just wants to provide a testimonial on your behalf, that's probably not gonna be too helpful. It's because you've really got a standardized list of questions that you have to answer to give equal opportunity to all certification bodies to have the same approval process. We did get a message correct. So I think you hit the nail on the head, okay. Lisa, thank you. And I believe that is, um, oh, another question. Is the VA funding the same as the GI Bill? It is, thank you. That's a very good question. Um, so the Department of Veterans Affairs oversees the administration of the, the GI Bill. And as many of you know, the GI Bill has a number of different components. They pay for education, um, you know, academic degrees and that kind of thing. And then this is a separate program that pays for, for certification. So just to be not to go through, too far in the weeds, but the VA basically uses these state approving agencies to do the approvals of organizations that are approved for GI Bill. So the umbrella is the VA, um, they are they're doing the oversight of the approval process for all GI Bill programs through the state approving agencies. Great, thank you, Lisa, for that clarification. And that appears to be all the questions. If anybody has any follow-up, um, you'll be getting our contact information. So you yes. can reach out to each of us individually. Okay, Doug, now over, oh, I'm Actually, sorry, Susan, Susan, over to Susan. Thanks, okay. Susan. Yeah, no worries. Uh, so I think that's all we have to share with you today. We want to thank you for joining us. We really appreciate you taking the time out of your day to learn more 
about how you can support credentialing efforts for our nation's service members, veterans, and their families. Hopefully the resources and information we've compiled into the military and veterans toolkit can be of some help as you consider including this critical community in your credentialing plans. We encourage you to spread the word, share the toolkit with your networks and anyone who you think might be interested in providing critical support in the credentialing space for, for the military community. If you're not currently catering to the needs of the military community, consider using these resources as uh, to communicate the value to your board and other stakeholders. And look closely at those best practices sections as you build your program. If you have any additional questions or recommendations for information or topics you'd like covered in the military and veterans toolkit, please feel free to reach out to Doug Weinbaum. Uh, you've got his contact information there with the ICE office and he'll share those with us. Great. Thank you, Susan and Lisa and Kelly and Sue for presenting today and for all of your hard work and time devoted to the development of the toolkit. It's been a pleasure supporting your efforts. I also wanna thank all of our attendees for joining us today and taking part in the launch of our military and veterans toolkit. Again, if you have any feedback or additional questions, please feel free to contact me at dweinbaum at credentialingexcellence.org or any of our panelists here today.